Hello together. My name is Martin Hertha and I'm very happy uh, to present my talk, Clinical Reasoning and Shared Decision-Making, How to Teach. The title has been uh, given to me by the organizers. I'm very grateful to the organizers. I'm sorry that I couldn't come personally to the meeting. Um, I'm a medical doctor and psychologist, and I'm teaching at the University Hospital in Hamburg in Germany. And this is just uh, the disclosure. So I'm receiving only public funding from different ministries, and uh, I'm chair of the advisory board at the Agency for Quality in Medicine. For today, um, I will briefly describe the two concepts of clinical reasoning and shared decision making, more focusing on shared decision making because my colleagues uh, before and after me, they are focusing a little bit more on uh, clinical reasoning. Then I will uh, tell you a little bit how we teach at our university medical school clinical reasoning and shared decision making. And maybe we have also to think about the connection between the two concepts. And then uh, at the end, uh, some ideas about how to implement these two teaching concepts in medical schools and clinical practice. So let's start with the, the concept of clinical reasoning. This is um, a core physician competency. Everybody knows who is a medical doctor that clinical reasoning before diagnosis is a, is a very important process. But it is not easy to understand because it represents a complex interplay of different cognitive processes. But the, the most important thing that it leads to important decisions in first in our head and then it will inform the diagnostic process. What does it comprise? So um, diagnostic uh, clinical reasoning clearly comprises collecting and analyzing data in the history of the patient. So the anamnesis is very important. Physical exam, then we are ordering tests because we might have a, a hypothesis uh, about the diagnosis. Then we have to interpret the results of uh, these tests and creating also the question, is there a differential diagnosis? And then at the end, we arrive at the most probable diagnosis. But we know also there can be a lot of cognitive errors, and that we will talk later um, about this, and they can impair clinical reasoning, and they are clearly important contributors to a possible misdiagnosis. And exactly regarding uh, this uh, frequency of misdiagnosis, we have been uh, in research and in clinic more aware about these uh, possible misdiagnoses, and that, that has led uh, at the end to more calls uh, to improve this uh, clinical reasoning training and also the assessment of clinical reasoning. And we must uh, state, and that's also important if we are trying to assess and, and to describe clinical reasoning of doctors, it cannot be directly observed. It must be inferred from behavior. So behavior is a very important assessment strategy, and we will talk later about this. The second concept of shared decision-making has been described in the late 90s for the first time by different um, Canadian colleagues from the McMaster University in Hamilton. And if you see on the right side, you see it has been also uh, taken on by the BMJ in 1999. And if you look to the two titles, it's uh, very important uh, how they describe it. Shared decision-making in the medical encounter what does this mean? So they are describing the concept, but it takes at least two to tango. And you see the picture, and later on we might discuss uh, if the tango image is the right image for shared decision making. And then in '99 they further um, yeah, elaborated the concept for the patient-physician encounter. It has been described as a model in between two other models which are known to you, the classical paternalistic model where the clinician is taking the decision. So reflect already on clinical reasoning, that's what's happening in our heads. But then here also in the medical decision-making model, in the paternalistic model, 
um, uh, the, the idea is that the clinician alone, clearly uh, talking to the patient, but the clinician alone is taking over the decision. And on the right side, you see the information model where only the patient takes the decision. And in the middle, there's the concept of shared decision-making, which means an interactive decision-making process, which is accounted by both patient and physician. And they are uh, equally participating and they are, they are equally active and they are sharing their information. And uh, Clint Elvin uh, from the US uh, has described it with colleagues more precisely um, and uh, telling that shared decision making is an approach where both clinicians and patients make decisions together. And then that's important because we are talking also about evidence-based medicine, using the best available evidence. Patients in the encounter are encouraged to think about the available screening and so on, uh, management or therapy, therapeutic options, and the likely benefits and harms, so advantages and disadvantages of different therapies. And uh, at the end, they can communicate their own preferences if they like more one or the other option uh, regarding the therapy. And we are helping the patients to select the best course of action for them. Let's just check the clinical context. Where is uh, shared decision-making appropriate? In many medical situations, shared decision-making is appropriate. Um, and there are some examples. If patients are undergoing a screening or diagnostic test like PSA or mammography or coloscopy, every medical or surgical procedure clearly, like a, a hip surgery or radiotherapy, and also taking medications. If we have more than one option to offer to our patients, patients should be in a shared decision-making process. But also other medical uh, programs and therapies like a self-management program for chronic conditions or also psychological interventions like psychotherapy or psychoeducation are important situations where SDM is uh, appropriate. Also at the end, uh, lifestyle changes where we need also uh, behavioral change uh, consultation encounters or to participate in preventive strategies are important situations where a shared decision making is important and also if patients have to select if it's better to be treated in or outpatient and at the end also the the important palliative care situations so end of life decisions are really situations where the shared decision making approach is appropriate but is is it clear that every patient really likes to be involved in the decision no, we have to. We have always to ask patients about their preference in for the different situations. Here you see a slide from a research we have done with German cancer patients, and you see here on the right side again is the is it more that patients like the physician led or the patient led decision? And you see here some numbers, so more or less five percent are saying uh, in, in their situation about cancer decisions, I prefer to leave all decisions regarding treatment to my physician. So that's the paternalistic approach. So there are clearly patients who prefer the paternalistic approach and also the information model. So patients are saying, I prefer to make decisions about which treatment I will receive. This is the classical information model. And here in the middle, you see I prefer that my decision and I share responsibility. That's the shared decision-making approach. And you see more or less a third of all patients. And then there are two bars where patients are saying, I'm slightly more, uh, more um, uh, inclined to um, the paternalistic model or more to the information model. That means that we always have to ask patients about their preferences when, we are, when it's coming to decisions. In the ideal work uh, and the ideal world, um, we would say that uh, when we are starting to talk to patients and after, fin after having finished the anamnesis, we are starting the clinical reasoning process and at the end, we are arriving to a diagnosis. Then we ha clearly have to inform patients and maybe there is, there's a need um, 
about uh, to yeah to, to help patients to understand. So the psychoeducation is very important. Then it's the, the decision making process starts, and then starting therapy. So let's go into the question: How we could teach uh, clinical reasoning and shared decision making? I'm coming from a university where we started ten years ago to put more efforts in, into communication and the clinical examination courses. So that's the picture you see from our ideal um, image of a doctor with a good professional attitude, with a high-skilled professional communication competency, and also clearly very good practical skills. And um, this is a slide from my colleague, Secret Harenza, who is responsible for the clinical reasoning courses. And you see here that our target audience for clinical reasons, reasoning is clearly um, medical students uh, with a lot of experience already in the medical school. So in their last theoretical year or the first practical year, so fifth or sixth year medical students or residents. And uh, we have developed this two hour course for eight weeks. So they are coming for two, for two hours for eight weeks uh, during uh, the semester. And you see here uh, the six learning units they are called. And this is a course we are, uh, where we are using paper cases. And uh, so we are presenting, for example, um, patients on as a paper case with a, a certain finding, a, a certain symptoms and findings, and then uh, it's the diagnostic process starts with uh, is there a pattern recognition, pattern recognition or no recognition, and so if if there's no pattern recognition, um, students are starting with the analytical approach about certain hypotheses. If there's a pattern recognition. Um, there's also the question, is there um, a potential cognitive error? So there are different learning units um, and it is so, it's important for, for the students to understand, like here in this uh, table, if this is a typical manifestation of a common disease or of a rare disease or maybe an atypical manifestation and manifestation and you know you, you understand this is all in the head of the doctor so uh, the next step is uh, how to assess uh, this process. And that's the, the second slide of, of the course. So you see here that's um, when they are advancing in the course, we are using simulated patients and they have uh, 60 minutes for these patients and they are different patients clearly. And then uh, we are trying to have uh, a situation where it is, where it is um, clinically very real. So there's a patient management phase where also nurses are coming and disturbing the doctor. And then there's the handover process with the residents and supervisors. There's also that, that's just a hint for you. There's a Canadian a North American group. Here you see the, uh, the website. And if you go into, you can go uh, into clinical reasoning practices via web. And there's also an explica explication. But let's jump now into the decision-making process. That's how we teach it. You see here, this is our module about shared decision-making. And you see here all the, the longitudinal tracking communication skills. So first we're starting with basic skills in communication, but I cannot go into detail. Maybe you can ask me if you are interested in our different courses here, but this is the course we are looking now into, which is the shared decision-making course. It's a lecture of 90 minutes and then two seminars of three hours each. And we are using the, the internationally developed model of shared decision-making, which is dividing the, the encounter with the patients into the team talk, the option talk, and the decision talk. And yeah, I will show you a little bit more what this means. And also we are using for um, this uh, um, teaching course um, the idea of that we can use also supporting tools. So we can use patient information material or so-called decision aids, which can be short or comprehensive, so they can be useful um, to you uh, to to um, use into uh, within the uh, encounter to help patients to understand. But I will talk a little bit later on that. And here you see how we are um, teaching the different uh, steps. 
So that's the so-called team talk. So we have first defined the problem. So in, we have to inform the patient that the decision has to be made. And then we ex express partners equality. And it's important that we express if there are different treatment options, that there are different options. We name the options and inform about the potential harms and benefits. So the advantages, advantages and disadvantages. And then clearly the preferences of the patients are very important. So we are trying to enable patients to explore their values and queries. We are preparing for decision making in the decision talk. And then we review arrangements. So we review the decision, including the possibility maybe patients are not able to make the decision today. So to postpone also the decision making. And these six steps are very important uh, for the medical students. And we are step by step teaching them. But what's the evidence about this approach? And we know from the shared decision making approach, there has been a lot of randomized control trials. And I just shortly will describe you the results and you see here, that's the Cochrane Library. And if you are interested, you can just look into it. That's, these are the, out, the most important outcomes. So there's an increase in participants' knowledge when, when you are using the SDM approach with uh, your patients. Also, if you are talking about numbers, so the accuracy of risk perception is higher than in treatment as usual. And also, and that's important, the congruency between the informed values and the care choices. There's also a decrease, which is important. So low, there's a lower percentage of patients um, who are in decisional conflict or they are uh, undecided. And there's also a lower proportion of, uh, of passive people in decision making. And we know the length of consultation, that's always a problem when we are talking about shared decision making. Many people think, oh, that's that's uh, that means that my consultation time is longer. It's only two minutes longer, it costs lower or similar to usual care, and there are no differences in psychosocial issues and no adverse events reported. And there are other further effects, which I will not go into detail. If you're interested, just check um, this publication, but there are also research needs. So we don't know if shared decision-making um, leads to more adherence, which would be important because if we are um, if, if patients are participating in, um, in decision making, maybe their adherence to therapy is higher. And we don't know exactly if it's cost effective. So we need more research. And, and it's also we are adapting now the concept to people with lower literacy. At the end, how can we help patients to do better clinical reasoning and also share decision making? Clearly, we have to encourage your, uh, our patients, please encourage your patients to prepare better for the encounter, to ask questions, maybe to take notes or to come with a family member. And these are the so-called ask three questions intervention, which is very good, uh, ev uh, very well evaluated already. It was developed in, in Australia. We have adapted it to Germany, though this is the, the so-called R3 questions intervention. So my summary and take home messages, uh, clinical reasoning and shared decision making, hopefully you have understood are very important physician competencies. Patients want to be involved in medical decisions. And um, th that means with regard, regard to their personal, their, their individual preferences. Clinical reasoning and shared decision-making models for teaching and research purposes have been developed internationally and there will be more exchange and you will hear more about these with, uh, from the colleagues. International exchange is important to adapt and improve uh, these um, concepts and uh, the question is how to train it well, um, how to train medical students and how to implement this, these interventions um, to scale up clinical reasoning and shared decision-making programs. So thanks for listening and greetings from Hamburg. Thank you very much. Um, there would be one question to you, if you don't mind. Uh, you showed us the concept that shared decision-making model sits somewhere in between, between paternalistic and information-based models. Do you think the location on this scale strongly depends on culture or it's uh, more 
general human and thus uh, irrelevant, you know, independent from cultural background. Yes, we know from. Can you can you hear me well? Very well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. It's it's shown by research that there are clearly cultural differences. Uh, but I think my my main message should be, it's a continuum between the classical paternalistic and the information model, and it's always good to ask patients uh, in what's their preference about uh, participation in the decision making. So it's a c clearly a continuum. It, it, it can shift also between different uh, medical decisions. So yeah, it's, it's important to ask. And we know older patients uh, are more confident with their doctors usually. There's an uh, um, um, education level difference. Uh, therefore, my recommendation, just ask the patient, uh, how would you like to be involved in this decision? And we know um, complex decisions in cancer care often um, are a challenge for patients. So it, it's, it's good to ask this question. Involving patients is always good, even if that decision about involvement. Thank you very much.